The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind. Driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a titan myth highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of DTRH. It is September 2nd, 2014. Tonight, I am joined by a good friend, someone I got a chance to talk to about two weeks ago on air, and... um we had an interesting discussion. It was on Hangar 18, and we got a, where we got a chance to actually sit and talk for the first time. And uh, although he, you know, I've known him from uh, Facebook for a while now, but I've got I got actually a, a chance to sit down and talk to him and discuss all this craziness that's going on. And you know, Hangar 18 is a show where we blow steam off and everything. And we had such the the, the discussion was so intense and incredible. And I knew that there are a lot of listeners to the show, but I know there's also people that don't tune in to, you know, Hangar 18 because it is uncensored and it's all the hosts just blowing off steam on a Saturday night. And so they might not realize that, you know, once in a while a, a piece of truth, a kernel of information does pop out. So tonight we're going to kind of dive into the same subjects you know, as in-depth as my guest wants to because he's the one that has the first-hand knowledge and experience, whereas I'm the investigator bringing the information to you. He's actually the witness to many of this, so it's going to blow your mind. And he's also got an awesome, awesome band, which you're going to get introduced to as well. So let's not waste any more time. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome my guest to the radio broadcast for this evening, Mr. Frank Castle of Heist Click. Frank, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, this feels great getting on the show and being able to uh, let loose for a couple hours. Well, I mean, after being able to talk to you the other day, I've been wanting to get you on for a while, but after being able to talk to you a couple weeks ago, on Hangar 18, you blew our mind, dude. I mean, usually that show is hijinks and mayhem. And I know, like, the first half hour we were all chatting about Amsterdam. And, you know, you and I were reminiscing about all the fun and all the weird stuff that we saw there. But uh, in the last hour, hour and a half, you just – you stole the show. You really did. You, I mean, you were dropping information – that was literally you had everybody on there. I mean, I was engaging with you, but I went back and I listened to it, and you could hear. I mean, you could literally hear like the wheels in my head turning, the wheels in Chris Geo's head, and Cherie Geo's head, Nathan Fraser. I mean, you could even the listeners were. In, I mean, I know they were intrigued. The chat room that night was just you know their mouths were on the floor. So uh, amazing, amazing information, brother. It's it's very hard to steal the show from Hangar 18 and turn it from being goofy to just dropping info bombs the way you did. And you did, and you kept it interesting for an hour and a half. That's why I was like, i, I got to get you on my show, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know it all comes from the heart anyway, you know, because uh, that, that was an interesting night, I'll tell you that. 
And um, there's so many truths that are just coming out at this point. And, uh, you know, that's how I am. I'm, I'm like a truth, I guess not a truther, but a truth seeker. You know, as Chris Gio would call me a warrior of the light. <laughs> I love it. We all should be that way. We all need to seek truth. That's the only way, you know, man. Uh, some people get whack and they sit back and they'd rather be lethargic about it. And they, they say, you know what? I got to go to work. I don't have time for this. I just don't have time. And it's like, all right, well, you know, that's, you're going to suffer just like the, <laughs> the ones that are doing the bad. My, my other favorite excuse is that doesn't affect me because I don't yeah, believe yeah. in it. Everyone oh. says that till it happens in your backyard, and then they'll be like, yo, the first thing that happened when, when uh, I got, my cousin wouldn't talk to me, and uh, my TSA, TSA searched my bags. Naturally, they attacked me at the, at the place, but they left me a note with the TSA note. Uh, people are like, hey, look, my cousin hits me up. I got one, too. I'm like, see? See how it affects? Everyone makes fun of you, and then all of a sudden, it's, wow, how did, how did you know that? It's like, well, it's pretty obvious at this point. It's blatant. It's in your face. Yeah, I think most people, unfortunately, most people don't really heed warnings or believe things until it happens to them. You know, I've seen people that were like complete, what they would consider themselves to be like uber liberals, anti gunners, and then they had their house broken into, and the daughter was raped and everything else, and the mother and father were assaulted and all this other stuff, and robbed. A huge home invasion, really bad, and now they all have guns and concealed weapons permits, and are you know staunch defenders of the Second Amendment. So it's amazing how someone's attitude can change after going through a life experience. You know what I mean? Listen, uh, if there's no food, a vegan will cut you up and eat you, roast you over a fire, just so they could survive, right? So that's how that works. I it's agree. All, it's, it's all bull until it's sitting right there and you're staring at it. You know, some people are funny. They stare at it too and go, oh, well, you know, how's that going to really – But I'll be gone by the time, you know, that might affect me. And then I just look at all the kids in the room and I go, really? So I guess nobody really here cares. And then I smile. <laughs> I try not to break chops too much because everybody, just from the way I look, when I walk into a room, they're already like, oh, God, here we go. And – uh it, it's kind of weird as it is, so I, 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 I let them hang themselves on their rope, and then I just drop some knowledge bombs and run. <laughs> yeah, you, you, uh, you go through the same thing I do, dude. I'm covered in tattoos, so when you walk in the room already, you're being prejudged. Uh, it's, yeah, am man. It, it's amazing. That's one of the reasons I told you off air I don't do video, because I challenge the listener to judge me based on my intellect. Not that, I mean, my outward appearance is anything of... You know, I don't have horns or anything, but I'm covered in tattoos. And some people might look at me like, oh, he's just some tattooed thug and doesn't know anything. When in reality, I'm actually highly intelligent. And I, you know, I'm actually a really good investigative journalist and investigator. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that if you judge me by the cover, right? You're going to be like, oh, tattooed scumbag. So doing radio, it just challenges the listener to actually pay attention to my intellect. And then, then you don't care. Once they get to know who I am, they don't care if I'm – I mean, I've met – I've met older ladies that were in like their 80s that were listeners of mine before, and they love my tattoos. And oh, it's so beautiful and pretty, and they pet my arms and stuff. Oh, it's so nice. So and like they don't care. Whereas I'm sure if I if they didn't know me before that, and they they saw me, I'm sure maybe at least half of them might have been a little bit more judgmental. So you know how it is, dude. I, I, I do. I, you know what it is? Oh, I get the excuse. Oh, he he's a rapper or he's a he's a rock guy or whatever. He's a musician. I come in the room, so right away I'm I'm being judged from all those weirdo angles. And then I just sit there and then I only say things that'll light up the crowd and then I just leave. No ego, no nothing. Get everyone thinking and then make them think it's sexy too. That's a whole nother thing I get into. I mean I try to make all waking people up and being you know, intelligent and whatever. I try to make it fun too. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to bring that back to make it make it socially acceptable to like have 20 people around, you know, smoking blunts or having a couple of beers and talking about it. And then people going, wow, that's intelligent and sexy. I think I'll go home with them tonight. Yeah, but that's what needs to be done because that's what they did to us, right? They hijacked yeah, that's exactly what they did. You know, I'm they doing to them the same thing. You're <laughs> using their technique against them. You're taking you you learned their playbook and now you're twisting it and using it for good. That's what we need to do. I know. I wish people would listen more often. You know, try to put it out there. You know, but we got some things in the works. 
like up front, I want to just I, I just want to throw it out there for artists because I know we're going to get into it a little bit tonight. And the industry out there is as bad as it gets, and you're dealing with the most ruthless of the most ruthless, and they're always trying to chip you and take your money. Everything's everything's not what it seems. That's all I'm going to say. But I'm in a music group called Heist Click H E I S T C L I C K. I'm signed to a, a record label called Music Before Money Records. And you can go to musicbeforemoneyrecords.com uh, to check them out. And we are doing a drink to that tour, and we're helping um, artists. Um, what you would normally pay, like, four grand for to go on tour and do all kinds of crazy things that you've always wanted to do in a total professional manner, we're now getting them in for, like, 80% off that price <laughs> Because we have full worldwide distribution through the label and label owners, Mr. Burns. So that's my partner in Heist Click. And uh, we have, a, take a look at what, what we post up. You could find us at Heist Click on Facebook or musicbeforemoney.com. We're giving artists the chance to get on and start touring and, uh, and getting worldwide distribution. Screw the majors. You don't even need them. We'll put you in, in different cities in Canada right now. But you could be an American artist and you go up to Canada and you could go on, uh, you know, a seven city tour for what it would cost you uh, like four grand for plus hotels and everything. We're doing it for like six hundred, six eighty, and we're giving you three years of worldwide distribution with it. So this is how we're about to pay it back. I've been on the inside. I've seen the playbook. I've seen how it works. Judo toss right back at you. Your serve, guys. You know, so. Uh, if you're out there and you're, you're listening and you want in on it, we're opening it up because of all the garbage that goes on deep inside, layer after layer of what you will find in the music industry and pretty much everywhere else at this point. That's, that's incredible. I mean, what you guys have gone through, I know your story somewhat, and I, I, I know that you guys have, uh, just like many others, actually had the balls to say, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. And we're going to get into all this, the, the deep, dark stuff. But before we do, Frank, because I know we're going to get sidetracked with that stuff, throw out your Facebook, <clears throat> your Twitter, and any websites you want to plug, YouTube channels. Like, just go go nuts. Give yourself shameless plugs galore. Okay. Um, well, you can check us out at Twitter, um, HeistClick, H-E-I-S-T-C-L-I-C-K. You can find us at the same place on Facebook. On YouTube, check us out, uh, Heist Click. You could go to Reverb Nation and go to Heist Click Music there, and it has all our tour dates and where we're going to be. Um, you could go to musicbeforemoneyrecords.com. You could check us out there. Uh, you could see all the interesting things that we've been up to. I just got off a, um, I, I toured for like two and a half weeks with some of the guys from Killer Bees and some Wu Tang guys and uh, me, Mr. Burns and myself and True Technique and DJ Hollywood. You know, shout outs to, to, to Born Divine. Like, I really went all the way. And I got an awesome story because last we spoke was prior to the tour, like a few days before. And then as soon as I start the tour, what do you think happens? So we'll dig deep uh, a little bit into that as we get into the show because it's going to justify everything that we're probably going to talk about tonight. Awesome. And the reason why I wanted you to plug your stuff and talk about yourself for a few minutes here is because I want people to understand that you're not some some dude that I met on Facebook and we became friends and you're some random conspiracy theorist guy and, oh, oh Pop, I sought him out just to do a radio show and have him on and talk about the music industry. No, Frank's a musician and he's been in the music industry for quite a long time. 17 I, years. So I don't bring people on the radio broadcast to tell you stuff that don't know what they're talking about. I bring you insiders as much as I can and Frank's as much an insider as you can get that's actually awake and said, uh, no, I'm not doing that. And you're going you're gonna to find out what I mean. So I guess let's start off in the beginning, Frank, because it, it's where the story starts. You know, as a good storyteller, it's good to give a little bit of background on sometimes on the subject, the main character who's helping tell a bit of the story, which would be you. So, and, and Heist Click is in itself part of this overall bigger story of the music industry because what you witnessed yourself. So, Let's start with the band itself. Talk a little bit about the band's history and then how you, you know, you came into this awakening because it all has this merge between the two. So, go ahead. All right. Well, back in uh oh god, like 94, 
95, I was doing rock music. Uh, I was, I'm from the, I'm from the Bronx. Um, I, uh, I'm very heavy into rock metal, even some of the glam bands, uh, things didn't really work out for that for me for a while. And I started doing security for, um, I did a little bit for Aerosmith. I did some for Coca-Cola or some weird, weird gigs. I seen a lot of, uh, behind the scenes and I seen, uh, from my personality, why it didn't work with rock is that it was just when grunge came out, remember it was that all original kind of sound. All of a sudden it came out of nowhere, the Seattle sound. We kind of had to have that. Right. And, uh, there wasn't a we at the time. So I went down to Florida for four years, thought about it a little bit, came home. My brother and a bunch of the guys were all hip hop artists all of a sudden, everybody in the Bronx raps, but not everybody's good. And these dudes were good. And they said, you know what? We're going to teach you how to do this. And, uh, we're going to throw the flip on it. Go rock nuts. But, you know, I, it's not like a Lincoln Park. It's like I'm a classic MC with the rock attitude, the rock hooks sometimes. <clears throat> and I have a real, I have a real, uh, there's something about like the, the, the years 1968, 1969, like kind of the Woodstock kind of rock, something in there that just stuck to me. I don't know why, but later on I to find out uh, part, that movement was what, kind of juiced everybody and then they shut it down thus you get the baby boomers the guys that were out there screaming with their shirts off free sex and love and everything and then they turn around and go to wall street and shut shut the shit down so um we decided to get together and and everybody there everybody that was friends was doing it and we all just stuck together as a team and uh the original members of the heist were formed and it was uh, me and my brother, two of his friends, which became my best friends. And they're way younger than me. They're like seven years younger. So in 98, we come out. We, uh, we went down to buy Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Anyone that knows the area knows it's a pretty rough neighborhood. And that's where hip-hop started, like right there, right down um, by like 164th, 154th, in between those spots. And th- the guys that were originals taught us like how to fl- flip it on the crowd, like in the middle of the street at four o'clock in the morning, drinking forties and smoking blunts. And we were the, the, the Italian kids that were down there doing it. And they're like, wow, you guys got this rockness to you. It's pretty cool. We're going to flip it this way. How about we get, um, some black Sabbath beats behind you? How about we'll take care of that. We'll show you how to do all that. And then you're on your own. And that's how it was formed. And we stuck together Man, we well, we've been together ever since, but the the band has gone through some changes. Uh, we have a lot of classic hip hop. We have uh, classic hip hop with messages behind it, and then we have kind of our rock twist uh, stuff. There's really no label to put us in a box because every time I try to do something in hip hop, I get labeled as like before I'm met, before my music's listened to. Oh, it's hip hop. Right. If they were to meet me, they'd be like, what is this guy in anthrax? Like, I don't even look like I'd be in hip hop. And that's the best part about it. The flip that we put on it in the original twist is really good. But you get tossed into, hey, you want to be on BET tonight? And it's like, uh, sure, but that's not who buys my stuff. You know, I'm more like a college kind of, you know, anthony hip hop with rock twist. And I've always got suckered into that area, which pulled us directly at one point. We won. Best New Original Hip Hop Group in New York City. We got a Jammy Award in like 2004. And, uh, and things really blew up. I mean like really fast. And the industry started getting their grips into us. And they signed me for Watchtower. And for those who know me know that's our big song from back in the day. Um, and they were like, oh, this is the greatest ever. We want to put this out. And the minute they took us in the front door... There was 16 weeks of horrible boot camp that was unnecessary and uncalled for. And, hey, we're going to just get rid of these lyrics and insert you guys in a, um, like, uh, like jumpsuits, different color jumpsuits, like you're a bunch of Italian guys out on the corner doing your thing. And we're going to rhyme about girls and, you know, just the basic garbage that's going on out there. And we straight up refused. Every single member refused. And at that point, for 16 weeks of that, they ripped up our contracts at Def Jam. They kicked us out into the street, and we went out cheering into the street. No, I got to pause you for a second. What do you mean 
16 weeks of music boot camp. We got about six minutes left before break, so we, we got plenty of time. What What is what is a 16 weeks of boot Does this include some of the things we were discussing on air on Hangar 18? With yeah, man. All the, so, okay, go ahead and you know, lay it out. I'll give boot you the Boot camp was like this. They, they, they brought me in with my whole crew, and they said, okay, we were in one of the Def Jam spots, and then uh, – <clears throat> they they right away got on. We were the only white kids there. I'm going to be open and honest about this. I'm not racist in any way, shape, or form, but it was very awkward. We were in Jamaica, Queens. Um, there was a three-level studio that would have blown your mind, but outside it looks like a crack house. Um, we went in there. They tried to – there was a bunch of us. There was other kids they were signing, and they put you through these torturous routines of, oh, freestyle about this, and they'd have a bunch of girls come in. I'm, I'm five foot eight. This girl was – got to be two inches taller than me, uh, ex-drill instructor, black girl, starts screaming at me because she didn't like the way I freestyle. So I just, just to throw the flip on it after she screamed at me because I'm I'm only a fully grown male adult, um, very professional and everything, and you just ran up and got in my face when I was just awesome, just to break me down again. Now, I didn't sign up for any of that crap, but she got a little, she took a lot of digs at me, so I just freestyled about what I would do to her and probably all her friends and how they feel about me. And that started this push like, yo, you, you guys do not listen. And this is what we want. And this is what we're going to do to you. And every day something was inserted as if it was like a stab to you and then a turn as if you're going to do it because if you want the contract, you're going to do it. All the way up to points where it got out of control. They wanted people doing all kinds of weird Crap! They, you know, they, I watched them basically go through every girl that was there was basically having sex with everybody that was one step higher than them. Actually, just the fact that you're there might even get it, get it for you. But then the guys were doing it to the guys too. I thought, but it was open. It wasn't like a closed thing. It was just like you're going to do this, and you have no choice. So when that are these record executives that are coming in? And it's all different kind of people. It's all dudes that work there that you rarely see. Then you get all kinds of bull. They they bully you. They'd be like, "Oh, this guy's this person." You didn't know who this was, and they'd get the girl to like you know. Listen, they get fifteen-year-old girls up in there, and and boys, and they tell them we need this white money and we need to do this, and we people were losing their minds in this place. It was like when when you wonder what it's like to be in that house. What you know, 10 other MMA fighters and it's just, it's just nuts. And I'm in there like, why is this a competition? I came, I came here to work to make music. Like I came to make music. This is first of all, not conducive to any kind of music. I don't know what rock stars you guys talk to, but all of my friends don't deal with this. I don't know what in the rock industry it does, but you guys are either on some mad trip and power horse or you're a bunch of fools that are just doing what you, maybe you were shown by the guy that was there because nobody lasts more than a few months or a few three years at most and all your important people last they bounce around to different positions and they're taking i mean full abuse now i could go into it there was a lot of sexual shit going on and uh it got around to us to where you're going to do what i say or i'm going to basically punch you in your in your face and they would not even come near me with that, right? What they did was they went to my younger brother, who's half my size. And they sent the biggest guy they could find in there to tell him, you're going to do this. Well, basically, you're not going to leave, right? So I'm like, what, what is this now? Now what is this? Go in there and have a talk with him with eight other people. He, he never is going to talk to nobody like that again. And they were freaked out by that. They were like, you guys just... Stand up as a crew. Use attack like a crew. They went to each one of us individually and told us we were the best and that we had to get the other guys to conform, like that it was going to be some kind of teeny thing that they were going to do. I'm like, you're trying to cut the balls off Axl Rose here. And every one of us is like me. I mean, I'm the heart and soul. I'm the one that kind of lasted the whole time. But at the same time, the people that were in it and involved had their heart and soul in it up to that point. And as far as I'm concerned, will always be heist. You know, and we all stood up as a team, but they were dangling the contract like, oh, if you don't do it now, you're not going to get it. Now, I know you heard that I had uh, or those who didn't know, I was also there uh, one night late. I wanted to meet Jay-Z. There he was coming. They're like, oh, he wants to meet you. So they were. I watched them 
open a closet, which I thought was a closet. It was like a double closet right on the main floor. It was all the way in the back, but it was a, there was like a dance area. You could open it. Man, there was like um, like an altar, but it was small because the closet wasn't deep. It was kind of, it was like half what a normal closet is in depth, and, but it was double wide because it was two doors that came out together. And uh, I said, what are you guys doing? They're like, oh, we're just, we're putting the masters together. And I knew the masters that were going in there. I knew that some of the kids that were just making that music. And I'm like, these were kids that were getting burnt out, some of them, like the things they were doing. I'm like, you don't need to do that, you know, to, to think you're going to make money. Now, I looked at the list of the people that are coming out. <clears throat> we were on the list with every major artist. And we were the last people on the list, and the list was pages long. And I said, I, I've never seen you release more than a handful of artists a year. What is this? And then I watched them shelving artists. So basically, I'm going to put one in your rear. You're going to take one for the team and like it. Then you're going to do what I tell you. Then we're not going to put you out and sign you off as a tax write-off. And I'm going to watch them. Now, I'm, I grew up Catholic. I'm not religious any any longer after that nonsense, but... I know something negative when I see it. And I just asked them, there's a lot of purple, there was some cult. I said, what are you doing? And they said, you need to get out of here. He was Catholic, he needs to leave. And I said, I know what you guys are doing. I says, I heard about this. And then we were fired, gone, contracts ripped up, destroyed, and literally kicked out. Like, don't ever come back. Because you, you stood up for yourself. Amazing stuff. I'm gonna pause this right there because the break's sneaking up. Ladies and gentlemen, three short minutes. We will be right back, stay tuned. So when we were going to break, ladies and gentlemen, Frank and I were discussing what he went through with Heist Click, what he went through with his band, and what he witnessed. <clears throat> you, know, you heard him say he was there, and Jay-Z came in, and they went into, he saw them go into a room. He was there, and they opened up these closet doors. And you heard him say that there was an altar in there. Okay, now I'm going to play a clip, and I actually played this for Frank the first time I got a chance to speak with him about this a couple weeks ago, and he had never heard this. So here you have two separate people from one from like 30 years ago, John Todd, talking about this. This was in the 70s, the clip I'm about to play, okay? And Frank here in 2014, and they're both saying the same thing. And it both links, it, it links up to all this other information. So I'm just saying, look, <clears throat> you don't have to believe what we're talking about. You don't, and I don't expect you to believe in what the elites believe in. But you need to understand that they do believe in it. Whether or not you like it or dislike it, they believe in it. And that makes it real. Yeah, because it, it affects us in one way, shape, or form. Because their belief, just like our belief, affects our reality and the reality of others around us. So they're does pushing, theirs. They're pushing their agenda through manipulation of the reality system that we are currently living in. That's why it's called culture creation, right? But anyway, before we Frank and I get sidetracked on that, because let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Frank is one deep individual, and he's let me tell you something. He's got a brain in that head of his that is stacked with information. Coming from a fellow, um, you know, like archivist of knowledge in your head, like if I would go, if you and I could go on Jeopardy. We would own Alex Trebek. Frank, it would be awesome. <laughs> Bring a few other people with us on there, and we would we would own that show. And like, I don't know, a week we could take all the earnings and turn it around and use it for good. Anyway, let me play this audio really clip. This is um, John Todd from the seventies discussing the altar and what they do with the master. And then Frank and I can get back into it. I sat on a council of thirteen people that take orders only from the Rothschild Tribunal in London which they claim they take their orders directly from Lucifer. I was the manager of Zodiac Productions, which Zodiac Productions' its name's been changed since then. I'm not even sure what they call it now, but it's the largest music conglomerate in the world. It owns RCA Records, Columbia Records, Motown Records, owns almost all the concert booking agencies in the United States. And that's not even the, the name of the company that owns it. The name of the company that owns it is Brenner Enterprises, and Brenner Enterprises is owned by Chase Manhattan, Chief Manhattan's owned by Standard Oil, and Standard Oil's owned by the Lords of London. You can track it on back. You kind of get the idea after a while. But I was the managing president of Zodiac Productions. It was one of my jobs as being one of these 13 people. Thus, I got to know many of the people who produced music and sang the music and played the music that you play. Now, one of the closest friends that I got during that time that I obtained was a man named David Crosby. 
Crosby, Still Nash, and Young. I saw David the day before Christmas last year, talked with him. I got him away from this witch that he had with him. He told her to go shopping. We were in West Hollywood, and I was witnessing around to people I knew. We went off in this store, and we started talking. I said, David, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. I said, I already know the answers, but I've been gone for five years. I'd like to know if certain things are still the way they were when I left. I said, do they... Now, I'll have to explain some of this when I'm done, because you're not going to understand it all unless you know something about music. I said, do they still take the master to the temple room? Dave said, yeah. I said, do they still have the coven conjure demons into the master? He said, of course. I said, now, i got to know something. What's the main reason for rock music? He said, come on, Lance, you know what the reason is. I said, please, David, I don't want to guess. Tell me what the main reason is. He says the same as when you were in, so that we can place spells on people that we couldn't cast spells upon. I'll explain what that means in a minute. I said, okay, one last thing. I've been hearing that you must be an initiated witch now to get a record contract. He said, that's right. He says, many of us that weren't total witches have to be witches now in order to produce music. Thank you. The master is a tape about as big as the top of this podium that looks like an overgrown eight track that the album is cut on and is placed in a machine that produces and presses the records and the eight tracks and cassettes that you buy. After it's been recorded, it's taken in. This is why a master is cut months in advance before it's released. On the full moon, it's taken in to a temple room about the size of this auditorium that is in every one of the major music companies behind locked doors up in the executive offices. And it's placed on an altar sitting in the north of the room and a pentagram engraved in the floor. And 13 hand-chosen witches and witch wizards and a coven come in and conjure a principality or a power up, usually Regia or something like that, and order him to tell the demons under him to follow every record and every tape coming off of that master. As I tell many Christian parents, you can go home and count your kids' records, probably yours too, and count how many demons at least are there. If that's too hard for you to believe, I'm sorry. That's why they do it. Now listen to me. This is why rock music's addicting. Have you ever seen kids that got rid of their music, they go around like this. They can't wait to find a rock station somewhere and they sneak off just like getting a cigarette or a fix because it's addicting. That's why they can't give it up. The rest of the conversation was this. You can't cast a spell on a Christian, but you can get a Christian to cast a spell on themselves. If you give the permission for the spell to work, being a Christian won't block it. And rock music is not just a song. It is supernatural music that which is carefully designed by their spirit guides or familiar spirits in the form of spells. Now, although the devil's music's power is the music and God's music is the words, much of the songs are written in what we call witch language. Give you kind of an idea. You talk, on, many of you talk on a CB, unless you know what you, what a smoky is, and a 10-4, and a, a, a front door and back door and rocking chair and these type of things, you don't know what you're talking about. Same with witches. When you're in the first and second level, you have to learn over 2,000 words that said by anybody else means something totally different than when you say them. Elton John has said he's never written a song or sung a song that wasn't in which language. And I want to show you something. See how many kids in here will be honest and adults. How many remember and have heard at least several times a song called Hotel California? Somebody tell me what it meant. <laughs> Quickly, somebody tell me what it meant. Huh? That's pretty close. But from the words, what did it mean? Well, that's more of a guess. See, most people can't tell you. That's why when people do drugs and they listen to songs in which language, they get some of the meaning. But most of the time, they can't tell you. Stop and think how many songs are out there that you really like and you don't have any idea what the person was talking about. Beyond the Yellow Brick Road? How about The Destroyer by Kiss? Can anybody tell me what it's about? Kiss said in it, kids, tell your parents. They're talking about Helder Skelter. Beatles sung Helder Skelter in which language nobody knew what it meant. Manson did because he belongs to the process. Helder Skelter is a several, several thousand year old word. Most of the music is either about Helder Skelter or a place called the Nightwinds, which is what Hotel California is about, and different doctrines of witchcraft. You listen to them, your parents let you listen to them, and they have no idea. Kiss openly bragged how they were gaining control of people through their music because the people played their music. They told how they didn't form their own group. Their church, because they were ordained ministers of the Satanist church, placed them together. And that's how most of the music is done. David Crosby, when him and Crosby, Still Nash and Young, produced the record Two Way Street. 
they ordered the principality of Medit to order demons of rebellion to go into the record and everybody that heard it would be rebellious against law and order and government. And it was one of the reasons for the great upheaval in the 60s was that one album. And they take open credit for it. How crazy is that? Now, that coincides with exactly what you were talking about. And I know we're going to get into it even more, but like it, when we were talking on Hangar 18, that is exactly what you were talking about. about it, and we're going to get into it with the heroin and why a lot of these stars use heroin and stuff like that. But this, this guy was talking in the 70s. How they they you know b- between the use of drugs and certain language spoken in music and song, they're they're controlling minds and po- at the very least and possibly even conjuring evil entities. I mean, and you saw this this altar. So now going back to what you saw, is is the master as big as it was? Or I'm I'm sure the technology for that thing has somewhat shrunk, but the altar that they, they end up cutting it on and doing this, this ceremony on is still some, probably the same. I'm sure just the equipment for the, the master has been shrunken down, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, definitely changed now. But the original reels, I mean, some people still use that. I mean, some people still go with it. When I was there, I saw it. So it was really weird. It was um, one of those moments where people were just standing around that, I guess belonged and the other people were just working and doing their thing because everybody, somebody was always in there and I just found it odd that these people were gathering here and this was going on and then right away they called me out because I was Italian, Catholic, this and that, right? you get judged right away by a lot of things and uh, I said, no, nah, I know what you're doing. I says, this is, this is no bueno right here because I had heard about that through many different things and you don't believe half of what you hear they say right and then only half of what you see just but i know what an altar looks like because i went to st Clair's for nine years (laughs) and every one of my friends was an altar boy and i know what that stuff looks like i know a robe when i see one they were all wearing white which was weird uh they kind of just had these like i thought they were wearing smocks remember when you had to wear those when you used to finger paint in school I thought that's what it was. And then I just left. I was like, you know what? I don't have time for this. My crew didn't have time for that. Like, we do, I'm there to work, and this is the atmosphere that, uh, that they're given. So it wasn't conducive to that. But they screwed up. Like I said, they gave us the internet. And uh, they gave me the ability to do what they would have charged me $50,000 for. I'll do in my underwear in my living room now. I'll make it sound just as good. And I only take that ego approach a little bit is because I'm, I dislike what they're doing at that top, but I love music and I love independent artists and, you know, there's nothing like a good song, you know, from your favorite artist. But what, they, what they're doing is bottlenecking it. And as everybody could see, I think you could judge now what's happening. I, if you can't see what's happening, you must be, you're the crazy one, trust me. Well, I mean, I know music sucks. We had this conversation about how there hasn't been good music since at least the 70s. but uh, And that's why, you know, all of today's music is just like films and everything else. There's not any really thing original. It's all stuff that we remember as kids being original, being redone and revamped and retooled. Uh, same basic message, maybe a little bit more twisted towards their agenda with a few things added here or there for propaganda. But... It's the same crap, and the music's not even music anymore. I mean, they use auto tunes. No one sings, and you can you can take someone that sounds like crap and turn them into, you know, the next quote unquote pop hit, and it's it, it's destroying music because it's not really that there's no talent anymore. Although people don't even understand what music was originally what it came from. Music came from sharing information from generation to generation. But you know, back when people were illiterate and couldn't read, they could they could learn to sing and they could they could learn these tales. That's how the Odyssey came out by um Homer. He was he was illiterate. So he was a but he was like a verbal poet. So he you know he spoke about it, he sung it and people wrote it down. I mean that's how the, the and that's like the first book that they give you the Odyssey and the Iliad, they give you that, uh, or, or the it, I think it was the Iliad and then the Odyssey. Sorry, it was the Iliad was the, the first one. So it would, it you know, they give you those in English class to read, and you 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 know what I mean? Like these things come from spoken or from spoken word, which actually was be, like in many cases being sung almost like poetry or modern day music, you know, bards, if you will, 
And that's where music actually gets its roots from. And now it's just about, quote unquote, entertainment. People don't realize the power that the music actually has on your mind and your spirit, right? Oh, yeah. It, well, all right. In the basic terms, you are in a ritual when you're singing. What do they get? People get into the zone. They all join in together. You know, what do witches do when they get together? They all go and chant and they hum and, and then guys that meditate go home. Well, you lose yourself in that moment when you're in music, both the performer and the audience. When you see the, what you've always wanted to see and you're there live and you're in the moment, you're doing the fist bump or the devil's fingers. Ah, you know, you're going crazy. You're participating in a ritual. That's why that feeling comes over you and you're like, whoa. Now, when negative energy has control of the ritual, you get what we have today, which is soulless music. And that comes from not writing your own music and not just being you. That's why people suck because it's not them. Right? I'm always me. Not to say that I'm any better than them, but I'll tell you right now. I am way better than Little Wayne. I don't care what anyone says. You could argue the money thing with me all day. He's horrible. Right. And people actually say he's the best of all time. And I'm like, listen, I'm not even going to put myself on any list. I'm just Biggie is rolling over in his grave. The fact that you're saying that he should come back to life. Tupac should powder his hand and then you get double slapped for even thinking something horrible like that. And that's why the, the song every it, the songs come so fast and it's a hit and it's gone. It's a hit and it's gone. Nobody remembers. Everybody remembers the good songs, though. Oh, oh, I remember that one. There's no more killer band that just always does it. What do you get? You get Nickelback, an overproduced group. Well, I have 30 producers. No wonder why the song sucked. Everyone's got their, their hand on your song, telling you how to stand, how to sing, how to move, how to rap, what to rap, what to say, when to say it, how to move, how to look at the camera. Oh, my God, give it a rest. How about you just write your song and have you and your band or group perform it? Right, that's why the music today absolutely is horrible. Terrestrial radio should just it should go and hang itself. We should find it in a room with a, a noose around its neck, like the belt, like as if it was masturbating and it was hanging itself. That's where terrestrial radio needs to go right now. Because they should be ashamed having to do that. Having to oh it's it's a it's a horror show. And they bottleneck all the good independent artists, so I'm not even gonna argue for myself. I know all the bands out there that are in my circle that are just awesome. And I would be more than happy if any one of them got the push. But you know why none of us are going to get the push? Because ain't nobody doing nothing um, on that side of things where it would take from me to you. to. I'd have to give in a piece of my soul. And that's However, all about control, what they're doing to them, right? I mean, it's literally yeah, they're it's dominating dominance. them, right? It's a dominant. Yeah, that's, that's how the ritual works, though. See, you get a bunch of useful idiots that just bang other people, right? So you have a guy in power. He's running the show from over there. You never hear or see his name. Then you got a dude like, we're going to use Jay-Z. He becomes president. He's really not owning the thing. There's a guy that owns this, right? And then he has guys under him doing stuff to those under people. And it just trickles straight down. So by the time it gets to you being a new artist, it's just a disgrace thing. But, but meanwhile, the practice is constantly on the, on the more dark side of things. I don't want to call it just dead up evil because you agree to it. You're, if you get tricked by that and you get pulled into that thing, that's your own fault. So you, that's you with your over ego, you know, I'll I'll do anything to get on. Oh, anything? Most of those people do anything and then they take them and they shelf them. And they, there's a write off and then others trickle through. And when I mean trickle, as you can see the artists that are on the radio, what I mean by trickle is who's new, who's great, what's going on? Is this, you know what I'm saying? It's just it's not the way it used to be. And they purposely did that and changed it. They went and they owned the industry. There was a point where you could get away with stuff. Not everybody was like that. Now everyone is like that. And why would you want to do that anyway? You want a 360 deal where you're actually a contractual slave that you'll make no money. I mean, I don't want to get into the boring parts of, of how this works, but let's just say you'll, in the entire universe, 
together because it's written in there. In the universe that we know it and, and live in and whatever, you are under these guidelines and rules as an artist. So if you went to Mars, you can't sing the song without their permission. Is is this the deal we were talking about where you, you said they get like a hundred grand and that's it, and then they have to yeah. cut a certain amount? No, go ahead and six take, six it, albums. We got a, we we got like eight minutes to go, take the time to explain this because this is important for people to understand because there's this huge disconnect with the general population and what goes on in the music industry. That's why when you hear an artist bitching, I'm not making any money, and people are like, "What are you talking about? You're all, yeah, this, you're money. all this money." Yeah, you're making money. Yeah, they don't. I don't think they understand. And I mean, sometimes artists. Are great, like Lars Ulrich of Metallica. Hey, he's a douche. Like they, they, those guys went down the douche canoe route. That whole band with what they did with, you know, copyright and everything else, and him, you know, riding the pony of we go after everybody. Rah. Okay, well, screw him. But I do understand legitimate griping if you're getting screwed by the industry itself, right? Like I mean, those guys made tons of money, but the people that are legitimately getting screwed, I understand their gripe, especially. The further I look into this, and the deeper I go, so we got about uh, we got about like six and a half minutes. Go ahead and explain what what is this deal, this three hundred and sixty deal that artists more often than not usually get from the music companies. All right, they basically sign you, and they'll go, "Oh, you're signed to whatever label," and you're like, "I did it. I'm in the majors," and they're like, oh, "Okay, well, we're going to give you a hundred thousand dollars," and with that hundred thousand, we want six albums from you. And at any time, the contract could change based on if they sneeze the wrong way or whatever to get into different numbers. And they take everything, right? Because this is how this works. You get 100000 You quit your job. You're like, ah, oh, I got money. Okay, you have to make six albums with that 100000 They have the right at any time to shelf you because you don't do the numbers. They have a, a clause in there where they do promotions and it doesn't give you like how much promotion they do. It's just kind of like, oh, we will promote you. And then it's at, they could put a post up on Facebook and they promote it for you. So they'll, you spend the money, the hundred grand on living and the first album, let's say, and you're eating off it and whatever. And you're like, don't worry, I'm getting promotion. My album's going to go big. And the album flops because they put it on Facebook post and it gets no push. And then, they say, well, you didn't fulfill your end of the contract. You didn't sell. So you're, you're liable to us for the 100000 Plus, you still have, owe them the albums. So you're basically wrapped in this blanket of nonsense for years and years. And there's no getting out of it. And it's just what it is. So, and, and in terms of making money... I mean, I would rather pay $10,000 to a company to promote me that just knows how to promote music than an actual record label because they'll charge you 100000 or let's say 50000 to be to be nice. And you'll get like nothing. I know I grew up with guys that they rhymed with everybody. They were down on the record companies promised them we'll do X, Y, and Z. They were on the major station here in New York, Hot 97, and then nothing happened. Poof, that moosh a whack to me. I knew a dealer, and I say a dealer because we wonder where he got this money from. And he just took all of his money and put it into himself and went directly at the industry like, I have my money, I'm going to buy my way in. They took his money, brought him on the radio, in the middle of his freestyle, cut him off and said he was whack and he was too Italian, spaghettis and lobster tails for you on Sunday with grandma and grandpa and just shut the radio off, get out of here, kid, you bother me. He, tell, he calls me and goes, yo, I lost everything. They took everything because of whatever weirdo clause in the contract that, that was in there. you know. And then they get, a, they get a percentage now of, oh, yeah, Mr. Burns, by the way, super shout out to Music Before Money Records, Mr. Burns, my, my partner. All right. Um, the companies get a percentage of everything, including shows, merchandise, sales that used to be 100% from the artist money. Um, they're not making money on album sales no more, so they're pretty, basically reaching into your pockets from every direction. Now, if you go solo and separate and say you spend 10 instead of 100 you can still do everything that you need to do and make the same money getting 100% of your royalties or, or putting money down on a distribution deal through like Music Before Money Records, wink, wink, and then actually getting somewhere in the world. You're getting promoted. You have a worldwide 
reach. You're in every market everywhere, and now you have to find the push. But if you have a good online presence, and let's say you have 14, 15,000 Twitter fans, you're going to make money, more money than if you just got the 100,000 and the six music deal, whatever, all that nonsense. You're going to make more money. And it, let's just say you're a kid that happens to have the equipment at home. You're already in business. You're in business. Now you have to have the drive and the ability to, to steer through the nonsense because there's a, there's a chokehold and they're not going to let you in. So you, you get in and you do the indie stuff and you never get into major stuff. But what you wind up doing is you get a collective, a collective of really good individuals, like good groups. And uh, one guy usually has the brains to, to do this, which is Mr. Burns. And then just push a hole to where everyone looks directly at us. And goes, what are you guys doing? And then what happens? The fingers come right out of the darkness. We want a piece of this. Uh, we want promotion. We'll give you distribution. We have distribution. We want promotion. We want sponsorship. We want money from you that I'm not required to be owned by you. How's that sound? Oh, you don't like it? Well, we're going to do this anyway. So what are they going to do? They're going to put their money in their, in, up. So but they're going to want a piece. Remember, anytime you invite the devil into your home, <laughs> he's taking you out of the home later on at some point. You know, So you got you to gotta think when, when you get into these things. Young artists, don't make mistakes. Stay independent. It, you're better off. I mean, if you're that good and you got it and you want to go do it, and some people might sneak through. I, well, who am I to say that I know everything? I only know my perspective. I know what I saw. I've been around for 17 years. I wouldn't waste my friggin' time. I, I just wouldn't do it. I would do it my way. Remember, your way is what sparked, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, people that made the, the computer and the car, and people that dream big and make comic books. That right? dudes like me read and get their morals from them because going to Catholic school, they caught beatings and didn't know why Jesus was so loving and God was so loving, but Sister Stabile could punch you right in your face. Just made no sense. Oh yeah, so, I, I caught rulers across the hand multiple times. Yeah, I got punched in the face a few times for for quest, just asking questions. I had teachers that were ex nuns, dude. Like they were former nuns, and we were in public school. And I still got the ruler across the hands, multiple occasions. I mean, I'm talking the old, not those plastic rulers from the '80s. I'm talking we had uh, the old wooden rulers. Yeah, the from, school board rulers from like the '50s with the with the metal ends on it, and they would always manage to hit you with that little metal bracket right on the knuckle and they would always nail you in between the second and third knuckle or excuse me the first and second knuckle and they would wham right on the top of your finger there sometimes they'd nail you by the cuticle but it was usually in between the first and second knuckle that first you know section where it bends oh oh but yeah that's okay don't worry about it you ask a question smack corporal punishment anyway break sneaking up three short minutes we're gonna get right back into it where we're leaving off don't go anywhere check out heist click Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. It is September 2nd, 2014. Tonight I'm joined by my friend Frank Castle from Heist Click. Go check the band out. I'm going to have him shamelessly plug everything one more time in a second. If you missed the first hour, go back in the archives and check it out later on when it's available. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. We're pretty much exposing the dark secrets, the dark underbelly of the modern-day music industry and what really goes on, the stuff that you don't know about. Uh, and there is a, a, a connection to the control of the masses, the manipulation of society. That's why they call it culture creation. Uh, the, the Satanism aspect, the, the connection to the powers that shouldn't be. So, it, you know, it's, it's, very, um, it's very apropos, as they would say. And it's, it's very significant to be discussing this i know maybe some people might be like the music industry but if you heard the first hour if you're just tuning in trust me you won't be disappointed and if you heard the first hour you'll you're already on board you know what i'm talking about so frank before we get into it shamelessly plug anything social media any upcoming events websites. i'm gonna, Go ahead. I'm gonna just tell you straight we're gonna we're gonna bring it back around and let you guys know that we're breaking that reality down Okay, and this is a, sh a shameless plug, but at the same time, um, this is for you, kind of like the artists out there. 
um, the people that want to get this experience that can't because major labels want to put a choke down on it. You know, you gotta if you believe in yourself, you gotta put money into yourself. And uh, Music Before Money Records, uh, you can check them out. MusicBeforeMoneyRecords.com. <clears throat> Shoutouts to Mr. Byrne. We're allow we're helping the artist do shows like a full tour, right? And and they're broken down by piece. Uh, by sections like two weeks here, two weeks here, two weeks here, week off here. So it's called the Drink to That Tour. There's four phases of it. Go to uh, musicbeforemoneyrecords.com. Check it out. You guys sign up with us. It's like 80% off what the majors would be charging because they charge you. Out of that 100000 too, that's another thing. So if you're going to play OzFest, it's 50000 to perform. So how about no? So that comes right out of that money. You know, Now you got to hope that you go there and sell T-shirts, but now they own they, – they take – 38% of your t-shirts and then they take uh, 49% of your, your record sales. Why don't you just do it yourself? Get out there on the road, meet the fans, get good social media going for, for just a, a quarter of the price that majors are charging. You'll get the same experience or you just want worldwide distribution. You could come check us out. Don't forget to uh, look me up on Twitter. It's at HeistClick, H-E-I-S-T-C-L-I-C-K. Um, don't forget to, you can find me there on Facebook and then I'll hit you from there as Frank Castle. Cause I, there's like 50 Punisher guys and I'm the Frank Castle right in the middle. And, uh, you can find us on Amazon and iTunes. And honestly, if you like the music, please support it because this is, uh, this is how we live. This is how we put bread on the table. So, you know, and it, it's all from the heart. You know, nothing that I do is gangster or garbage in any way. But I will wake you up with anthems and awesome stuff that would get your chick ready to rock and roll. So with that in mind, you know, show some love and come check out Heist Click maybe on YouTube, H-E-I-S-T-C-L-I-C-K. Check them out. I support them. Frank's a good guy. They do good music. I, 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 when you were talking about Anthrax earlier, that's what I was thinking the same time. I was like, yeah, they're kind of like Anthrax. It's like a mixture of... Metal, and I get you could fit in with hip hop a little bit, but it's like this mixture, uh, you know, more, more. I, I would say more rock metal, but still enough mixture of the two that you can appeal to to various uh, audiences. So that's that's kind of interesting. Now, actually, I want to ask you about that because there's there's this whole manipulation of society thing, um, and I'll, I'll I'll ask you about that in a second about appealing to to mass audiences on a different level and why that was done. But before we move on from the Satanism thing, I've got to bring up one last thing. The Rain Man. And this is an interesting thing that keeps coming up in multiple artists where they talk about the Rain Man. Who supposedly is the Rain Man? I, I just want to say it like this because after what I've been through, I'm not playing with no more um, games with the, the different entities that these guys call in. But... Let's just categorize it as demon as far as I'm concerned. You know, uh, these guys actually do stuff like that. They call demons to protect them. I know this sounds so funny and so ridiculous. They're like down with the dark side. Picture it. If this was a Star Wars movie, these guys would be like, yo, Jabba the Hutt and Darth Vader are the best ever. And, you know, we support them fully. And, you know, think of it like that. And you'd be best, you know, you know, because then and then Darth Vader shows up and he protects you with a lightsaber. I mean, that's how it works. I swear that's how it works. I've been, I've, I've been talking about this for so long that I go on tour right after I talk to you two days later and you know what was going on, what I was doing. I'm I open my third eye. I go on a spiritual walk with my brothers and uh, it tells me what's going on. And I I. It's like I knew it already, but this was like super hyper detailed. And what's the first thing that happens the minute I leave the nest and go into the real world where it really gets deep? They bring me and sit me down and start talking to me about my birth sign, my birth date, when I, I astrologically fall to be part of the perform. We heard you did this, so we want you to call this. Um, entity over and it's going to protect us from what they're using against us and I'm like oh whoa 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 time out that, there's none of that going to be nothing like that's going to happen around me I'm going to explain why what I was told was that I wouldn't 
when I'm around, that won't work. <laughs> That's basically how that happens. And I was curious, why is this done? And they said, because they're using it against us. Why would we not protect us ourselves back against them? And my only answer was, why would you bring a demon or whatever to fight a demon or whatever? Now you then now there's two of them. Why are you guys playing with that? And at that point, nothing really worked for them. They were, their guy complained a little bit, like, no one wants to do anything. And I'm like, well, I told you, when I'm around, it's not going to work. I shine way too bright for that, that, that mumbo-jumbo. Like, I'll keep everybody here safe. Don't worry about it. And everybody was cool. Every, it was great. Everybody became super tight, and everything worked good. And that one guy that does that stuff was not so good. You know, and it's just really weird to watch stuff like that happen. I know it sounds a little hippie, but I am not a fuck. I'm not, I'm not a hippie. Anyone that knows me, I am not. Uh, so what I witnessed firsthand is some freaky stuff. I have some uh, from tapes of, of, of people tell, like explaining to me this is how you do stuff as well. You know, um, it's, it's very awkward, man. I mean, when you're sitting there, would you believe it? Would you believe that if you saw that? Wouldn't you think that's a little, a little outrageous or a little crazy? Knowing, into- knowing some of the stuff that they do, like I mean, especially like th- they'll make them witness of like a baby being sacrificed, literally something deplorable, absolutely horrific. Uh, and you know, we were discussing this, and you know, sometimes it, the the only way that you're moved on to the next phase almost is like when you go through that if you witness that some people vomit some people can't handle it they leave the room you were you were saying some people even try to intervene what happens to the people that try to intervene are they ever killed or injured in the well, in the I, attempt i just know well i haven't seen that part of it i've seen people roughed up and stuff but on a spiritual level you're taken right off the chessboard that's how i put it like that once they know that there's something up with you you're out if you're not totally mind controllable and you're just a yes person, oh yes, 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 you might as well be somebody that sings, but that gets coffee for everybody on a set. Like you might as well because they're just going to tell you what you're doing. You're going to do this, and you're not going to like it. Whatever, we don't give a shit. And then, how many more artists do you have to hear it from? Uh, you heard it from DMX. You heard it from Dave Chappelle. You heard it from. There's a whole slew of characters. You know what? Just look them up. You, you've heard it from. Uh, um, God, Tom, uh, Roseanne Barr, you've heard it from her, and she was crazy, right? The, check out her video on uh, Comedy Central Roast. The opening intro, they show clips of her, and I, I was watching it live. I was like, oh, this is interesting, and then um, they're like, how are you even famous at this point? And this was like from back in the day, and uh, the, they were trying to make, I think it was Johnny Carson was like trying to like, like make a joke out of it. And she goes, well, honey, you know how it is. I made a deal with the devil, right? And then you flip to, um, there's a whole bunch of rock artists too. And you get into it uh, and they, they openly say, well, you know what I did? You know, you got to do what you got to do. You know, they take that leap. I don't know really how they, at that, at that level, other than like the sexual stuff, I don't know what they're doing with these people. I don't know what kind of, you know, what do you believe in kind of thing. Maybe they bring them around to witness something and and uh, if they go nuts or whatever, you're just out. Maybe they would put someone out. Who the hell knows at this point? Everybody's a useful idiot, though. Everybody gets to the point where they think they're the shit and they're not because there's a guy signing your checks. If somebody's signing your check, you are not even close to the top. I'm just going to be honest with you. And you got to stop thinking that other people are going to do for you because that's how they play off of you, by the way. They know that you want it so bad that you'll do anything for that one moment in glory that is so empty and not worth it. How about a whole bunch of little glories that lead up to a big glory? How about building it for yourself? Waiting in line and, and, and down in New York City so you could sing on, on TV – is kind of depressing and cute at the same time. I would kind of see it if it was for like little kids, but people are stampeding like it's a Walmart on Black Friday for this one shot, so everyone can see them. Why? So you could post that on Facebook when you're fat and forty, and that's the only thing that you've ever done in your life. Which, by the way, you didn't do because there's a million other people that had it. It just so happens that that conglomeration of people just picked you and said, "No, no, you're doing it. Whatever." 
And you're like, but these other people sing so much better. Right, because it has nothing to do with that. You call it politics if you want. Just say it's politics if you don't believe in it. If you don't want to believe like, the fact that they believe in it, it's real. See, that's the problem. They manifest because that's what they want to do. And then with that intent behind it, they're passing it on to you. And there's this fear-based, oh, my God, I'm shaking because I'll do anything. You're, they got you. You're just, you just got. And in terms of like the rock back in the day, you could tell which ones were involved and which ones weren't. It wasn't every single one of them. But, man, I started looking back recently. And uh, like they were just talking about Helta Skelta. And the first thing that popped in my head, ah, Motley Crue. Like they're, they're done too. Like you, you just pick it up. They talk, Oh, here's another thing. I'm talking to these guys and uh, they talk in code in the songs. They got mad at other artists for overdoing it that people would, didn't understand the lyrics. I remember listening to the song and going, wow, that's like pyramids and, you know, right angles to the, you know, lines within lines and rides to the, so- to the sky. I'm like, this guy is talking about sacred geometry and whatever and they were like how do you know that i'm like what do you mean how do i know that I mean, it doesn't matter how i know how what are you doing like i that i have this weird approach on people that are doing stuff like that like do you know what you're you're, you're handling right now and don't look at me like because it it gets overboard you know what you do now is going to reflect on you Right well, a lot of them, done. a lot of them are ignorant and they're arrogant because they think they know what they're talking about, but they really don't. And then you're willf- you become a willful participant in whatever it is they're trying to do to you. And if they're not trying to do some satanic ritual and it's just some guy being a complete jerk, then you have just submitted completely to a total bully, which is still making yourself a victim. And event- without even realizing it, many times they're still put put they're putting the karmic debt on you as the individual and you end up eating that karmic debt and then you know even if you don't want to later on you're like well I wouldn't have done that if I had known it doesn't matter you that's not the way the universe works you you partook in it you know ignorance of the law doesn't justify as a defense it doesn't work in yeah. universal law and it doesn't work in man's law I mean, maybe that's where they got the idea from when they came up with the law here anyway uh it's just i mean it's crazy dude and I mean, just the stuff that you we were talking about. I mean, that, that's why I'm glad that you were willing to discuss this because there's so many people that won't talk about this, or uh, if they do talk about it, they're afraid of being taken, you know, like they're conspiracy theorists or they're crazy or anything like that. It's not uh, like that. It's not like that. I'll, I'll, I'll look at this. This is going to be no. Um, they're not going to put a foothold on me. Like I'm not going to go to work every day because this is what I do. Right and have fear in me because I have to go to work. Are you serious? This is why I have problems with hip hop in general because people want to shoot people. I'm like, well, Metallica may be a pain in the butt, but nobody's shooting at them, right? Like there, there gets to this point where it's like, eh. there's a full blown control system taking over, and it right now it owns the movies, and it owns. Did you know that Star Wars? They didn't want Star Wars to be made because they didn't like uh, George Lucas. But back then, you still had the ability to go out and make the money to get the movie made, and he made Star Wars. Whatever he did after that, and you want to call him something after that, that's fine. But in the very beginning, he wasn't. Believe me, he wasn't because he was out there hustling for that loot. We have that ability to kind of do it now, get some good sponsors. There's a lot of like – there's so many companies everywhere. If you could present yourself, you know, uh, as a good artist and a professional, you can make the money and you could get out there and you could be on radio shows and you could talk and get your you sell your stuff and then go do shows just like us. Like we're offering, um, you know, like the, the package tours, <clears throat> the end, what would you rather do? One show, let's say 10,000 people where you, you sing for 10 minutes or would you rather do like 50 shows and have like up to uh, let's say anywhere from like 50 to 150 people at every single show uh, a variation of in between but they're not going to be gigantic venues but every single one you're going to go is like that and you're going to be here then you're going to be here then you're going to be there then you're going to be over would you rather have that are you looking for one big moment or is this your career what are you looking to do because if if you go the side of it like i know a few of the guys that are like career artists that 
they're really good, but they live on your couch, you know? But yet they're working with the hottest whatever. And I tell them, you don't see what's going on? You're a pretty boy. You know what happens next, right? <laughs> and they laugh at me, and then they disappear for long periods of time. And then something's going to happen, it's going to happen, but then it doesn't quite just work out. I even talked to um, one night, just for like a minute, I talked to Jerry Cantrell. I went to a show down in the city, and we started talking. And he's like, there's 300 people at the show. If you imagine Alice in Chains, there's 300 people at the show. And that was like, that's squeezing it. And he's, he was like laughing, like, I can't get the people... You know, it's just, it's not like that anymore. And I'm like, man, uh, you don't have to tell me. I started out, we were getting 550 people a show, 1,000 people, and it dwindled down. To, you do shows where there's like two people sometimes. Sometimes there's nobody there. It's just you guys and like the bartender. And other times, it's, it's ridiculous. And you just got to push through it. But it's not worth submitting to the ultimate system of corruption for one moment. Because what's going to happen is it's just going to drag you down. You see these people getting ugly anyway. They have to go for all kinds of um, uh, augmentations for their body. Mentally, they start doing stuff like Kabbalah and and this weird kind of yoga. And then their music is, you watch their video and all of a sudden there's symbolic messages across it. You know what's funny though? The artist has really nothing to do with that. Like everyone's like Katy Perry, whatever. I guarantee you, she probably knows, but she's not in charge of any of that. Like, that's their ideas. They're putting that out. Little Wayne is like that because they want that to be there. Well, you know, you were talking about the symbols in music and stuff and rock, and, and you could you went back in the 80s and you were looking at, like, the glam rock bands and then the, the, you know, Motley Crue and all them. You know who, from the 90s, remember the club music in the 90s? And I can't remember, I think her name was Solange. No, well, it's not Solange. What the hell is her name? She, um, the song is the, the Rhythm of the Night. But I, oh. can't, I, I can't remember who sings it. But if That's... you... If you look up the video, go watch the video now, with 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 your open with your third eye open now, right? Go watch the video on YouTube when we get off air, and you're gonna hit me back up and be like, "Holy crap, Popeye!" I, I swear to God, I was randomly looking through '80s music one night, just sitting here. I I was taking a, a 45 minute break, and I was just going through some music, trying to compile like a list to play while I went back to work. And YouTube, and I was going through 80s music, and I saw the rhythm of the night, and I was like, oh, I remember that song. I was like, it was kind of catchy, and I clicked on it, and it was like the first or second link I clicked on. And, you know, the universe works in mysterious ways. It opened up, and I'm watching the first 30 seconds of the video, and I see all these esoteric symbols and stuff being flashed, and I'm, you know, like, but just enough that you're seeing them, but they're in and out in like a half a second to a second but it's there just enough for not only your subconscious to pick it up but your conscious mind to pick it up and throughout the whole video it's just this chick dancing around singing the song in different locations with all these different signs flashing in and out of the video and i'm like what the hell just happened in my mind was i just mind raped like i yeah. literally felt drained and i realized and i you know i i kind of say it laughing because at first it, it hit, I, I was a little stunned by it, but like I said, by the end of the song, I, and it, I shouldn't say I was stunned by it. I guess I was surprised that I didn't notice it until now because I remembered the song back then, and I was aware of the Illuminati and stuff back then. But it was, I guess you know, none of us were – not all of us were on that awakened level yet, right, where you could see it with you – know, I, I say I have the Hoffman sunglasses on permanently now from They Live, so I can see everything. I see Neo. You know, I see what Neo saw, the Matrix code, so it's much different now. But as soon as I saw it, Frank, I was like, what? What? Are you are, – how did I miss this the first time? So then I, st- I spent like the next hour and a half just going through 80s music videos, everything I could remember, like of that genre, that pop, clubby, culture genre from the 90s. And dude, all of that stuff was just cake with it. Remember a group called um, KLF? Yeah. I- go look at their, go look at their were- videos. Like ju- there's one called Justified and Ancient. And they're all they're they're talking about some group that they're that they're justified and they're ancient and they're all they're, they're talking about this group of people in robes and they're coming in on a boat and it looks like ancient Egypt and Tammy Wynette 
the country singer is the lead. She's like the, the lead singer in that song. Blonde, you know, blonde hair. Totally, you know, if you understand MK Ultra and the the whole blonde mind control thing, she fits it. And then when you research mind control and you research like Kathy O'Brien's book, she names Tammy Wynette as one of the mind control slaves. She talks. She exposes country music how they run drugs through the country music industry, and a lot of those uh, female country singers are mind controlled. And if you know whoever they're married to is usually their handler, just like Russell Brand with Katy Perry, and it, you know it goes on and on and on and on and on. But then you see this, you see this song. Like now, having all this information, right? I go back and I see this video, and I'm like, oh my god, it's all pyramids. You know what I mean? It, like you can't, you can't just say ah, it's just gimmicky, Popeye. No, it's not just gimmicky. There's something more to it. There's a reason why this band. I mean, who? Where's KLF now? Do you know where they are? I certainly don't know. They seem to be like one-hit wonders, right? They came out of nowhere, really popular, all these flashy music videos with all the special effects, and then poof, gone. Where the hell they go? Just like what you said. They come in, they do their thing, and they go away. Because you are useful to, for what you are just useful for. And by the way, controlled opposition is Russell Brand. They run both sides of the gammy. I'm going to explain how this works because people still don't believe it. They have to tell you what they're doing to you, and you have to willingly accept it and deal with it. See, you're, the fact that you just deal with it, you're still participating in the ritual. And when you go, well, I don't deal with that, that nonsense. It doesn't concern me. Um, that is participation in saying, no, I'm down. Like, you have to be not part of that. Oh, God. It, 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 it's a living ritual, that goes on at all times. I know that sounds funny, but how else do you think all these ridiculous things go on and all these people are in charge? And do you think everybody's crazy? Do you think DMX smokes that much crack? Like, do you... All right. By watching the symbols, it keeps it in your brain, in the back, burning, right? And the fact is, you could manipulate the, the Matrix code. There are people that have done it. Enough people believe in something, it happens, kind of. You know, it's, it really works that way. They get you watching it, singing the song. It's been blessed the wrong way. All of a sudden, nobody cares that there's just whack music everywhere. Everyone's got the T-shirts on, the this, the that. You're in a giant living ritual. That's what's going on. And that's why they're capable of doing what they're doing. And I know that sounds funny to you. And you go, oh, that's not whatever. And that's how they win every time. <laughs> All right. Does it, it has to come to your doorstep to actually be that way? I mean, in my life, it is that. I had a, I, man, I thought I was going to be a rock star, all crazy. Ah, and I got there, dude. And I went, whoa. I told my crew, we come here. We sit at our own table. We're nice to people. And that's it. I'm not here to hang out with you. I'm here to hang out with me. Right? Like, you wouldn't have the party without me because it was getting ugly, man. Ugly. And yeah, you could party and you could do what you got to do. We still do everything we need to do. It's just not like that. <laughs> like, it gets ugly at one point. I mean, what are you willing to sacrifice? That's what, that's, yo, here, here's another one. Kanye West. You don't think he. He sacrificed something. I'm going to just throw it out there. Possibly his mother. You don't think there's been other people that, uh, what would you give up to do this? And then they get there and they're like, oh, this is pretty empty. This is pretty empty. Nobody cares when you're there. Like the fans may love you. Ah, look, it's them. You go home. You're like shaking like a leaf. I watched these empty people just move around. And the, the mind control... When you're like, how could this person possibly go along with this? How could this work? And then you meet them and you see that they're just an empty husk and they're only good as their last role or that last hit they had. Then then you have a better understanding of it. I'm going to cut us off right there, Frank, because the break's sneaking up. Ladies and gentlemen, three short minutes. Do not go anywhere. You don't want to miss the final segment. Mind-blowing information, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, as I said, I was talking with Frank about this a couple weeks ago. And it's very impromptu. We just all got together on an episode of Hangar 18 on Saturdays, the uncensored uh, steam blowing off show here, whatever you want to call it. That's really a horrible description, but whatever, you know, our, our pressure relief valve, I guess is what you could call it. And um, when he came on and he was telling us all this stuff, it was just, I mean, 
as I said, Hangar 18 is usually fun and jocularity and screwing around, and there's not much intellectual value. I mean, sometimes we talk about real subjects, but, you know, it's like if you were hanging out at the bar with us. And Frank came on and just stole the show with this information. I mean, and it was a little bit more raw because we were all cursing and stuff a little bit more, which is it's, – it's, it's fun to be uh, free and uncensored like that. That's why we do it once a week. But, um, I mean, the stuff he was telling us is just mind-blowing. Um, I mean, literally, it made my jaw drop. That's why I had to get him back on. He's going to have to come back on. Frank, you're going to have to come back on again because uh, obviously one show is just not enough to pick your brain, not only about this, but, I mean, all this stuff out there, especially since now, like, you've had this awakening and you're on this this next level of your journey. Uh, I, I, I'm interested to see, you know, your your analysis of things in the future, too, you know, with this new set of shades or eyeglasses, uh, so to speak, that you have. Um, we were having an interesting off-air conversation about stuff that you witnessed yourself, uh, and you can get into that as much as you want. I don't want you to, you know, feel free to talk about that as much as you want, uh, you know, cover it. No, well, I know. think I think I, I think I actually touched on this before. Like, I was, all right, right as I left Denver after, uh, this was like, what, almost a month and a half ago? It was right after I spoke to you on Hangar 18, right? I stepped out and uh, I couldn't stop talking about uh, what it looks like with my new glasses on, How's that? <laughs> if that's a way to say it. And um, I've already been putting a lot of good things into practice. But then doing this, what I was told and what I've seen during my experience was a little much to take in. But at the same time, I dropped my ego a long time ago. And I have this, I have this really great sense of fantasy and, and childhood fun still in me. And it allows me to like kind of soak some of this in. And then when I talk about it, it's almost like I saw this fantastic movie or something. And oh, my God. So a lot of people had to hear me talk immediately following what happened. So I was on – there was like popular uh, artists from a, from a 90s group. And it was like the inner sittings of what was going on. And I was just pulled in to talk. They had listened to me talk nonsense now for a couple of you know like 24 hours straight like oh, i can't believe this oh my god so they're like it's like you know what's going on and i'm like no i know what's going on like i was so <laughs> eager and then their spiritual guy their advisor which was weird to have a spiritual advisor i i guess that's people have that i usually they're priests or you know uh, a guy like Mickey from Rocky, you know, get up, get up, Rock, you know, something like that. And uh, this guy was trying to get me to say a name of an entity from Saturn. I know that sounds funny. I know it's as crazy as that sounds. Okay. They wanted me to say it. And they tried to get me to repeat it. And I almost said it. I swear I was smoking uh, a joint and allegedly... And I was going, oh, yeah, what, what? And I repeated some of it, and I stopped. And I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? One thing I've learned to do is control my position. Never be in a room too, too drunk or too messed up where you can't handle the situation because there's people in the room that you don't know or can't trust. So it goes down to just watching your mouth and listening before you talk. And I just looked at them and I, I, I said, how do you say that again? And the guy said it again. He says, you're going to say it. And I said, no, I'm not going to say it. It's not going to happen. So you could get, it, get that out of your head now. And he's like, no, nah, nothing's going to work if you don't say it. I'm like, why me? Why do I have to say it? You know, like, because apparently you're the one with the, at the time, the astrological sign was the, my number was nine, they said. And that I was a, a Leo, a fire sign and something like that. And they, they, got, they pulled out a book. And they were they were plotting where the where the planets will be aligned at what time would be the proper time to do things and I'm like holy crap what is going on here doesn't anyone just do music anymore why is there always something whether it's a physical thing like a sexual ridiculous favor or something spiritual in nature like sign your will to Satan I mean give me a break guys really but the fact of the matter is is that that is. Uh, really what's happening and they're manifesting things for themselves but mostly but you know with the thought like oh yeah 
this guy's in charge. And that was within the past few weeks, right? This was, I just got off tour. I've only been home two weeks, two and a half weeks. So I was out there with them for a while. So the last time I spoke to you, just a few days later, and when I spoke to you, it was, my, it was after my first night. I went another two full nights on doing all kinds of interesting uh, spiritual stuff. And uh, I, I saw so much confirmation and more. Like when you talk about the matrix and the code, and I saw it. I actually saw the code break down. See, it's not ones and zeros like that. It's atoms. It's shapes of atoms. Now, nothing I say take to the effect like, oh, well, Frank knows, so that's the end-all, be-all to it. Absolutely not. It apparently affects and does things differently with each person. But um, I saw, saw the matrix code, which is just made of atoms, not ones and zeros, and I, I watched it dissipate, and I was teleported into another dimension. I know this sounds hysterical, but anyone that knows uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, and I, I was shown the most, <clears throat> the craziest things you can see that you'd go, no, nah, that can't, that can't happen. That, that can't be what's happening. And you're like, well, you've seen this, 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 and this. Why can't that be possible? And then you go out into the world, and the first thing that starts happening is that. And you're like, wait a second, am I manifesting this? Am I changing this? Well, the industry as a whole, let's just, because it, it goes all the way back up the ladder in every different industry, and we could get political if you want with it too. And it goes back up the chain, and everyone's involved in something they probably, really, most of the people don't even know what they're doing. And they're conjuring, they're, they're, they're protecting themselves, they're changing and warping reality through television and movies and symbols on everything this keeps you thinking about it right and what do you have the power to do in your mind anything that you can think of you can make right now i know that sounds funny on a certain level but really is it they're just finding out now that people could have the healing touch to a degree um you know they have they're very empathetic towards each other they finish each other's thoughts um they see the same thing in a psychedelic thing but a mass hallucination how, how many times are you going to write off weather balloons for ufo's guys right like how much more deeper does it need to go that i experienced something here and some aborigine on the other side of the planet's been writing about this for 3000 years but frank from the bronx who looks like carmine ragu with a bald head and a, and a beard he has the same experience that he does how, did, how is that even possible? Well, it's possible. And with you participating in these rituals without knowing, or if you know, it is way worse if you know and do nothing. I'm telling you right now. And ignorance is no excuse, by the way. You don't get out of it because you're a little, duh, duh, it doesn't work like that. Sorry. Calm is blasting you directly in your face. And I know it's not the answer to every question, but if we live in a flesh and blood reality, then 50% of this is flesh and blood because you can't believe in, and, and you, can't, you can't trust your eyes more than 50% and what you've heard for 50%. So 50% of you is here. The other 50% of you is there for at least the ones that, that have souls. All right. All right. You're participating in this, and by doing that, it's actually changing the reality to what they want. See, it's a handful of people with the power to move things, right? Why do they move it? You're actually doing all the work for them. People don't really see that. A lot of people look at the projection on the wall. <clears throat> when you look at the projection and nobody looks at who's projecting it, you tend to get caught up in the film. And remember, it's just that. It's just a film. Right? You're just looking at a shadow on the wall. Cavemen did that stuff too. This stuff has been around for thousands of years. How do you think the same people are in charge? Really? Really? Come on. Let's really think about this. I have a full education. Okay? I have a double associate's in English and psychology. Right? I know that's not sounds like a lot, but I'm from the Bronx, and all I've done is security my whole life, and, uh, and, and jobs like that. I'm a rough and tough guy. I like to think I have a fantasy world I live in because I love comic books and, and, and superheroes and all kinds of... I got my moral structure from that and, and growing up Catholic. Okay, Now, how is it that I am just blatantly seeing this? I couldn't become a U.S. Marshal. You want to know why? And I chose a musician because you have to guard pedophiles. Now, we could get into this soberly if you like and just go, listen, politicians, they like to dip into it sometimes. And you're like, how do you know that for real? Well, 
you ever go for a job and you're in the same field as people and people like rotate in and out and you see them, hey, look, it's Bill from over there. Oh, yeah, they fired me because of this thing. It's called talking to people that are, in, that are actually there. And uh, I, I could never do that. I, how do I guard somebody that it can do anything they want behind this door and I'm not supposed to do anything? No, nah, they'd have an accident, dude, so I couldn't do the job either. Oh, I, I, like I, I, he'd fall down the stairs accidentally and break I his neck. I expressed that, and they, they completely turned around on me and, and walked away. And I'm glad they did. Okay, do you know they tried to get me to sign up for Border Patrol once? And it was when that issue was when they were, they're not allowed to shoot over the border, only back at the American, on the American side and stuff. And there's only like one bullet in the gun, or there's some people have empty clips. And, and I knew all of this just from the people that I, the circle of people that I knew, you know, on top of music, I had to have jobs, you know, and uh, all these ex military and all these, everybody's got a friggin' story. Um, and if it's not a physically depressing one, it's a spiritually depressing one. You know, why do you feel drained every day? Why do some people just don't? Do you know what's in your water? Do you know what that does? Do you know what's in the tap water? It's called fluoride. It's in your toothpaste, too. My dentist, guess what? Doesn't use fluoride anymore. Okay, my doctor, he gives me penicillin when I get sick, if I get sick now, because I decided to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. But guess what else happened? Something else happened in my mind when this happened. I felt like a superhero. Think of the brain capacity when you were a child, but with the wisdom you have now, and it running like that, where you could be like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I wish I had the energy of that kid. Um, you can have that energy right back. You just got to make a few changes. I mean, if you're incredibly overweight or just really disgustingly fucked up or something, I, you, just, you have issues, you slowly do it. Slowly do it and watch what happens. I was one of those guys. I lost like 60 pounds. I went from... A thinking guy, but I, I'm an Italian guy. I like my spaghetti and, and uh, you know, and my chicken cutlet parmesan. But I, I cut back on all that stuff, and it all made, it all made perfect sense. Even uh, just eating organic stuff, dude. Like, like I, I changed my whole diet up to eating just straight or like as, not. I mean, I, I there are times you, 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 you can't tell if it's organic or not, but you try to at least get conventional, not GMO stuff, right? But, um. I switched my diet up to mainly, I would say, like 95% organic food. And just from doing that, because it's a, li- it's a little bit more expensive to buy it, you end up eating smaller portions, but you're also eating healthier food. And you end up, you don't crave to eat more because the food you're eating actually has the nutrients in it that you need. So your body's not craving anything. And you end up shedding all this ec- excess weight that you end up putting on because your body was eating all this extra crap that it didn't need. And you end up overall being more healthy and the more physically healthy you are the more mentally healthy you'll be yeah it just it exercise cleans you out both ways yes that's it exactly when you all right you go outside you go for your first jog it might be like a little uh you break that that three days soreness kind of thing and you go back out and do it again and you you feel awesome right now imagine that five months later except you're eating right and you're exercising and you're just walking let's say you speed walk you do some body squats and stuff, a couple of push-ups. Body in motion tends to stay in motion. Your brain is going to kickstart into overdrive. Start using some coconut oil on your food and watch what happens to your brain. Or to oh, take I- vitamin D and take some turmeric for that inflammatory problem that you have in whatever it is that you have a problem with and watch what happens. I have nerve damage and uh, you know, I've had 10 operations since I got out of the military and um, like I have nerve damage really bad in my right hand. And um, I have constant pain. Like it feels like my hand is on fire, uh, at least from the tip of my middle finger all the way down the m- <clears throat> to my wrist, and it goes right up through my hand. It makes it really hard to operate my hand at times. And um, you know, no matter what they give you narcotics, it never really makes it go away. It kind of just dulls it out. But then you get hooked on that stuff. So I, I would just take nothing and just work through it and suck it up. And even the surgeons and the doctors would be like, "Dude, take something." Like, what are you a masochist? And I was like, "No, just you know." And I, I, I'm not into this. I'm not. I don't want to. Uh, you know. Uh, I, I don't want to take pills. So I started looking up. You know, turmeric and other natural stuff. And I made uh, my own homemade adobo mix because I like Spanish food. So and I cook a lot. So I made my own homemade adobo because the the regular adobo has, which is Spanish seasoning, has uh, GMO and 
um, what do you call it? That other crap, um, not aspartame, uh, the other MSG in it. So I, di- I didn't want to put that in there. So I get all organic ingredients and I make my own and put one of the ingredients in there is turmeric. Uh, and there's a few other things like I put cayenne pepper in there, which is also good for you. Um, and a, a few other things. And when I, I put, I literally put it on everything I eat. I mean, everything I eat, I sprinkle it on. And the reason I do it is because just like they used to in the past, I, I use the, um, the herbs and the, the spices as, you know, natural medicine. And honestly, I'll be around somebody that's like coughing their brains out and sick, and uh, I don't I don't get sick. And, and you know and I'm not boasting or you know pat myself on the back, but it's because I give my immune system what it needs to kick the crap out of whatever my body comes into to play with. And I find that 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 really got boosted when I started eating a lot healthier. And, and then you're exposed to all the the microwaves and everything else. And then on top of it, like you said, you're, you know, sometimes you think differently, you act differently. Going back to that, there was an interesting point you brought up when we were talking about the, the frequency. And I know this has been discussed, but the frequency that music is even recorded on is a frequency that's used to, you know, it's on the same, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it the same frequency that the human mind operates on? So they, and they, it's done that way on purpose. That way it, it's more easy or it's easier for them, I should say, to get your, into the music and then control you? Well, what they do is th- there's two frequencies. Off the top of my head right now, I know the the, <clears throat> the demon frequency, we'll call it, but call it whatever you want, right? Um, that's like five-something gigahertz. The, the universe is actually at 400-and-something gigahertz. Don't quote me. Just type it into Google. Ask for um, uh, the God vibration, the God frequency, and the demon frequency. Just put a look at the two separate ones. Your brain works on an electrical current. It's, 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 it, it can be manipulated at a frequency similar to the current. The current has a frequency, too. And they just tune it in. If it's at the sound of the universe, it's one thing. If it's the other sound, which is what it's going on now, this is my opinion from what I know up to this point, And I'm learning more and more daily. So I'm not afraid to go back on something if it's, you know, if I say and then it's, it's not like that. But um, you're participating in bringing stuff through. That you're manifesting it. There are things out there that... Um, they call them demons. Some people are like they're like the aliens or whatever. Spiritual wise, ask your grandparents if they're still around, or even your parents, like of uh, any immig- immig- any immigrant uh, from Europe would know. Like there's like little hand symbols and like they put like little hexes on you and stuff. A lot of people would swear by these things. I know my grandmother did. She's like, "Don't you be giving the eye in the in the house?" I'm like, what do you mean giving you the eye? Now it makes. So many years later, it makes total sense what they were doing. They, the old Italians were putting hexes on people and to, to, to kill the karma from coming back to get you and threefold by putting something on someone else. You got to go kill a chicken or, or do something ridiculous. You remember the gold, the little gold hand that they used to, was it the Mallorca, whatever they called yeah. it, they used to hang from? When I was a kid, I grew up in an Italian neighborhood in North Jersey. I was born in Patterson. You know, I grew up right across the river from New York. And I grew up with, you know, around a lot of Italian people, as as did my father. So I was exposed to that. And I used to see, I used to see the Italians putting curses on each other all the time and hexes on each other. When you're a kid, you laugh about it, but, ne- but you're like, these people can't take this seriously. Oh, you know, it's superstition. But now you you look back on this with, you know, as an adult with a more open mind. And you're like, holy crap! These people, some of them probably actually believed that they were putting a curse on each other. But that intent is what puts the curse on you. It's not like some monster that comes out of the deep. It's you. It's that person. It's the intent is so strong. And then you offer to the universe something. Well, it's like the simple lesson learned from the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy Krueger is the evil monster, right? And he comes to you, he can kill you, he can do whatever he wants, but only if you fear him and give him that energy and give him that power. So you have to give the negativity, the hate, that evil energy, whatever you call it, you have to give it the power, whatever the power may be, whether it's your fear, whether it's whatever, that it, you have to empower that, even if you're doing it yourself, you know. Or and it reminds me of that 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 story of the the two Indians, the little the young Indian, and he's talking to the old Indian chief, and he says, "Hey, uh, you know, there's these inside of us." That, and this is the Indian chief. He says, "There's these two wolves inside of us, a, a, a light one and a dark one." 
and they're constantly at a battle with each other. And the young Indian looks up at the chief and says, well, which one wins? And the old wise Indian chief looks down at the young Indian and says, the one we feed. So, you know, I think if you feed into that too, that you have to give up a part of yourself. Again, they're tricked into it, but ignorance is really no excuse. And there has to be a certain point which, you know, you see them sacrificing a baby or something like that. And you're like, okay, you know, there's got to be a line where your conscious mind is like, hmm, hmm. I'm, I mean, I, I just re- I really wonder what it takes. Look, on a spiritual level, just to not point fingers at people because the conspiracy goes so deep and it's so winding and it's so annoying at this point. What do you think 9-11 was? Right? What do you think the war is that's going on right now? You really think it's for oil or something? Like, are you on crack? <laughs> like, this is a spiritual warfare. They're murdering children by the bucket load, right? And you're saying, like, oh, well, it's war. It doesn't matter. They're murdering women and children. Do you know in history books what that falls into that category? Not just war, right? It's when they were just, just in biblical times. They would murder every firstborn. Everyone in that house gets it. There will be no more. It's a slaughter on a biblical scale, minus the religion. This is, they, it really is a war for your mind because you have the internet. Your tools have been given to you. You could be dumbed down, but there are people here to help wake you up. If you do nothing at that point and you hear it, and pff, whatever. Listen, I might not be 100% right to you, but I bet you there's at least 10% in what I said somewhere in there that makes a little sense to you, which will get you thinking on your own accord, and then fine, have a nice day. Wake up any way you want. Believe any way you want, but don't do that. There are people, if, if, if bombs were going off here, what would you be saying? You know, at that point, you'd just be like, oh my God, what, we didn't, I didn't do nothing. You didn't do nothing. I'm sure the people over there didn't do nothing. It's just them doing it to us. There's a reason for it. It all always points to the same reason. It's not aliens. It's not UFOs. It's all us mixed in there with probably some more of us and, uh, and, uh, and an ET here and there. Think about it beyond the beyond, right? It's, they're, they're winning your soul, man. They're going to make you line up to get shot, and you're going to want to. You're going to run out in front of it like it's American Idol. Bop, whatever that shot is, they might not physically actually shoot you. They might do something ridiculous, you know, keep you in control in some way. Um, let's see, put a chip in you. Um, I don't know. They're changing things in the school so much these days with, with kids. It's just okay maybe to tase an eight-year-old, maybe. That's okay. And any, anybody else see they're wrong with that? I'll tell you what, dude. If I had kids, this is one of the reasons I don't. Because if I had kids in some D-bag resource School officer, I don't care if they have a badge or not, whatever. Tased my son. I Come would, on, man. Dude, I don't. I wouldn't. I might not react right away. I might wait. I might wait a week. When the guy's at Dunkin' Donuts, one day I'm just gonna walk up and knock his jaw right off his face. But do you know in the universe? Look, there. This he does that. The karma goes out there. The big part of the system, you know, the machine, it laughs because that's them getting more power now. But you going back and, like, tasing him in the nuts, although you'd be wrong in society's eyes and they'll lock you away, you'd be right in the eyes of karma. Dude, you'd be, is, I'm sorry, but you'd be balancing things out totally. Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> I, I, dude, I saw that shit. I saw how it works. I understand and, the whole idea of turning the other cheek, but sometimes, sometimes it's like that, that song, The Coward of the County, the little Kenny Rogers yeah. song. Like he, the guy, the guy tried to lead a good life because his dad was a prisoner and he was trying, you know, or, or a convict and he was trying to you know, be a good guy. Don't get in the trouble I did. And then they rape his wife and he walks into the bar and they're all like, "Oh, you coward!" And he goes to turn around, walk towards the door, and they're all laughing. And he stops and he locks it. And then yeah. he turns around and he cleans house. And he said at the end of the song, "Sometimes man's got to do what a man's got to do." You know, exactly. so, sometimes you just got to whoop a little ass when necessary. And, you know, I, that's, again, that's one of the reasons I don't have kids, dude. If, if, if that was my child, I would react extremely negatively to that situation. I mean, to say the least. So uh, in, Back in the day, okay, and I'm not talking that far ago. I'm talking 20 years ago. If a cop did what he did now, okay, like just openly, there would be mobs of people beating the crap out of him. I'm not saying to do that. 
I'm just saying, look what it's progressed to. And it's I'm like not Stockholm telling- syndrome. We've we that's why they do things progressively, you know, a la frogs in the pot method. That way, because yeah. if they did it, see back then, if they had done that, what they're doing now, people would oh, revolt. God. But now we're to a point where it's like, okay, it's all good. Frank, I got to interrupt us because the end of the show is here. So I'm gonna have to have you back on, brother. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Dude, I could do this all day and all night. Well, thank you for having me. But it, it's an honor, man. Ladies and gentlemen, check out Ice Click. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Frank will be back on sooner rather than later, I promise. Until tomorrow night, like I always tell you, the solutions to our problems are an inside job. Be the hero that you all have inside of you. I know you all have the capability of doing it, so be the hero. I love you all. We're out of here. Peace.